Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Ominous Origins Podcast with me, Casey. Of course, this episode is still brought to you by the wonderful people over at MorbidlyBeautiful.com. Morbidly Beautiful is your one-stop shop for all things horror content related in terms of everything. Really, literally everything. Reviews, top ten lists, podcasts, whatever you want, they have it. Go check out MorbidlyBeautiful.com right now. So, last week we talked about a guy called... Brian Schaefer. He mysteriously vanished and nobody's ever heard from him since the day he went missing. But one theory was that he was a victim of a purported serial killer, only known as the Smiley Face Murderer. Now, just who was the Smiley Face Murderer? Well, nobody knows. It could have been a gang of people, it could have been a single person, or it could have just been, well, nothing. A lot of people think it's nothing more than just a theory. But let's explore that theory. And, well, another interesting case pops up when you look up the smiley face murderer. Ominous. Ominous. It is an adjective. Sounds like someone breathing. Ominous. Now, as I mentioned, the smiley face murderer is more of a theory. And that theory was put together by... New York City detectives Ken Gannon and Anthony Duarte, as well as Dr. Lee Gilbertson, a criminal justice professor and gang expert at St. Cloud University. It alleges that a number of young men found dead in bodies of water across several Midwestern American states from the late 1990s to the early 2010s did not actually drown accidentally, as concluded by law enforcement agencies, but they were victims of a serial killer or killers. The term smiley face became connected to the alleged murders when it was made public that police had discovered graffiti depicting a smiley face near the locations where they think the serial killer or killers dumped the bodies in at least a dozen of these cases. Gannon wrote a textbook case study on the subject titled Case Studies in Drowning Forensics. The response of law enforcement investigators and other experts have been largely skeptical. It does seem a little bit too much out of a movie to be real, but it's not the first time and it probably won't be the last time we've heard of smiley faces being connected to serial killers. But again, we'll get to that a little bit later on. As recently as 2017, Gannon and Duarte were examining evidence going back to the late 1990s that they believe connects the death of 45 college-age males whose dead bodies were found in water in 11 states often after leaving parties or bars where they had been drinking. The men, according to former detectives, often fit a profile of being popular, athletic, successful students who were mostly white. Gannon and Duarte have theorized that the young men were all murdered either by an individual or an organized group of killers. That's some out of a clockwork orange right there. Some smiley face killers just walk in the streets of London, or in this case, the American Midwest, killing people and leaving their calling card. Like I said, out of a movie, it does seem a little bit grandiose, not gonna lie. It is a possibility that these detectives were looking a little too deep into things, just, just to get a little bit more public attention. Maybe they want to be in a movie themselves one day, so they decided to create their own. Or maybe they're completely dead on, and maybe they're right. Maybe it's a cover-up by the FBI and other law enforcement agencies because they don't believe them. Huh? Uh, well, you never know. Of course, reception of the theory did come in, well, mixed responses, we could say. As I said, other law enforcement agencies have investigated the deaths, and they dispute the conclusion that the cases are linked. Police departments that are involved do not currently view the deaths associated with smiley faces presented at the scene. They don't see it as a serial killer either. The La Crosse, Wisconsin Police Department, which was in charge of eight of the investigations, concluded that the deaths were accidental drownings of inebriated men and stated that no smiley faces symbols were found in connection with any of these cases. I smell a cover-up. The Center for Homicide Research published a research brief that also attempted to scientifically refute the theory. In March 2009, Lee Gilbertson, a criminal justice faculty member at the St. Cloud University, voiced his support for the theory on an episode of Larry King Live in which he alleged the murders were connected. Criminal profiler Pat Brown calls the serial killer theory ludicrous, arguing that evidence does not fit 
what is known about serial killers. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Yes, we do know a lot about serial killers, and they've been profiled and studied and researched extensively. But, just like any scientific theory or scientific paradigm, there can be a shift, there can be something new that pops up that you've never seen before. And refusing to admit that, or refusing to add that into the collection of what we know about serial killers, is a little, just a little irresponsible in my opinion, but hey, I'm not professional here. Mr. Brown also, I don't know why I said Mr. like, Mr. J. Anyway, Brown also believes that the smiley face images found in some of the cases are likely nothing more than coincidences based upon guesses as to where the bodies entered the water, with smiley face graffiti only found after a wide search of the area. Quote, it's not an unusual symbol, she told Minneapolis-based newspaper City Pages saying, quote, if you look in any five mile square, I bet you could find a smiley face. The FBI also issued the following statement. The FBI has reviewed the information about the victims provided by retired police detectives who have dubbed the incidents the smiley face murders, and they've interviewed an individual who provided information to the detectives. To date, we have not developed any evidence to support links between these tragic deaths or any evidence substantiating the theory that these deaths are the work of a serial killer or killers. The vast majority of these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings. The FBI will continue to work with local police and the affected areas to provide support as requested. Ruben Rosario of the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Jesus, that's a tongue twister, has questioned Gannon's motives, stating that Gannon has failed to provide any factual evidence that a group of serial killers exists. Rosario noted that Christy Peel, the original reporter of the theory and some of the parents of the deceased have discussed and since expressed skepticism despite initially supporting the idea. Another parent, Kathy Gieb, is working with Peel and others, but their main goal is to convince police to take a second look at the cases of alcohol-related drownings. So what do you think? Do you think there's an actual serial killer running around or a group or a gang, maybe some sort of cult? Hmm. When it comes to death, you can't rule anything out, especially when you find a body washed up on shore miles from where it possibly fell in. Now, there's a good chance that these are nothing more than accidents, but there are a lot of accidents apparently. What do we say, 45 college-aged males who are all athletic, successful students, and mostly white, they all fit a specific type, and maybe that is what these serial killers are going after. Maybe they just don't like rich, successful, athletic, popular white students who are male. Maybe it's a gang of women who are wronged by these people or people like these people. Who knows? Who knows? Or it could just be Chad got a little drunk and fell into the river. It's possible as well. But I did mention earlier that there was an actual serial killer who used the happy face or smiley face as a calling card. So let's dive into the life of Keith Hunter Jesperson. He was a Canadian American serial killer in the early 1990s. And maybe that's where this got perpetuated from, this whole smiley face thing. There were some twists and turns with this case here and we're gonna look at the early life of Keith Hunter Jesperson, who was born on April 6th, 1955 to Leslie and Gladys Jesperson in a Chilliwick, BC, Canada. I keep finding these Canadian serial killers. It's kind of weird, but hey, well, let's just roll with it. Let's go. Come on. The middle child with two brothers and two sisters, Jesperson's father was a domineering alcoholic, and according to Jesperson, his paternal grandfather was prone to violence as well. Jesperson's father denied being an abusive parent. However, while investigating for his book on the killer, author Jack Olson was able to confirm much of the claimed issues with other family members. Jesperson was treated like an outcast by his own family and teased by other children for his large size at a young age. Jesperson was a lonely child who showed a propensity for torturing and killing animals, which we all know kind of fits in that triangle of kind of debunked serial killer psychotic behavior as a child, but it still is weird, right? I mean, the other ones are starting fires and pissing the bed or something like that, but I think a lot of those were debunked, but torturing and killing animals I still think is up there, or if it's not, it should be. Even after moving to Washington in the United States, he had trouble fitting in and making friends because of his large size. So that keeps popping up, and just how big was this guy? Well, 
Well, at 35 years old, he stood at 6 foot 7.5 inches and weighed approximately 240 pounds, which is a big guy, I'm not gonna lie. But why would kids tease somebody that much bigger than him? Just wondering, you know, for a friend who is also like 6'7". Yeah, I have a friend about that tall. He's not that big, but he's that tall. And uh, I wouldn't go around telling him he's a freak or something because of his size, because I know he could kill me. Just like Jesperson, apparently. That's kind of a bad segue. Anyway, let's continue. His brothers and family didn't help. Instead, they nicknamed him Igor, or Ig, a name that stuck throughout his school years. Because of this, Jesperson was a shy child, content to play by himself much of the time. He would often get into trouble for behaving badly, sometimes violently, and would be severely punished by his father. These punishments included beatings, sometimes with a belt in front of others, and in one case, he received an electric shock. At a very early age, as young as five even, Jesperson would capture and torture animals. He enjoyed watching animals kill each other, as well as the feeling he got from taking their lives. This continued as he got older. Jesperson would capture birds and stray cats and dogs around the trailer park where he lived with his family, severely beating the animals and then strangling them to death something for which he claims his father was proud of. I mean, you gotta have parental support in something in your life, I guess. Cultivating the behavior of a serial killer is something? A plus dad? Father of the year? I don't know. Maybe. However, in the following years, Jesperson said he often thought about what it would be like to do the same to a human, and that's where the fantasy aspect comes in. As any serial killer will tell you, Fantasizing about doing something is only good until it sucks and you can't get it up anymore. You need to do the real thing. Animals aren't going to do it for you. You gotta move on to the most dangerous game of all, humans. And that fantasy manifested in to two attempted murders. The first happened when Jesperson was around 10 years old, when he had a friend named Martin. The two would often get into trouble together, and Jesperson claimed he was often punished many times for things Martin had done and shifted the blame. This of course led Jesperson to violently attack Martin until his father pulled him away. He later claimed his intention was indeed to kill the boy. Approximately one year later, Jesperson was swimming in a lake with another boy when he held him underwater until he blacked out. Sometime later at a public pool, Jesperson attempted to drown the boy by holding his hand underwater until a lifeguard pulled him away. Obviously, this is the typical sign of a serial killer, but yeah, you know, this is still the early 70s, something like that, so the knowledge on criminal and psychotic behavior just wasn't quite there yet. It was being worked on, but it wasn't quite at what it is today. Now, if it wasn't enough, Jesperson reported that he was raped at the age of 14. That's gonna make some mental scars. He graduated from high school in 1973, but did not attend college because his father did not believe he could do it. I've kind of been there once or twice in my life too. A lot of people said I couldn't do college, couldn't do university, and well, they may be right, but you know, I do have a degree, or diploma, or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, this isn't about me, Mr. Jesperson, and how he killed some people. Although Jesperson was not successful with girls in high school, having never attended a school dance or prom, he did enter into a relationship after high school. In 1975, when Jesperson was age 20, he married Rose Huck, and the couple had three children together, two daughters and one son. Jesperson worked as a truck driver to support the family. During his time as a trucker, it appears that Jesperson got up to some funny business, because after a few years, Huck began to suspect Jefferson was having affairs with estranged women when they would just call. Tension in the marriage increased, and after 14 years while Jesperson was on the road, Huck packed up her shit, her kids' belongings, and drove 200 miles away to live with her parents in Spokane, Washington. The oldest child, Melissa, was 10 years old at the time. Jesperson continued to spend time with his children when he was in town. The couple later divorced in 1990. Now, as I said, at age 35, he was a big boy. He stood 6 foot 7 and a half inches tall and weighed approximately 240 pounds. Jesperson began working towards the goal of joining the RCMP, or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is weird, but an injury suffered while training ended his endeavor. He then sought work again as an interstate truck driver after relocating to Cheney, Washington. Jesperson soon realized that his job afforded him the opportunity to kill without being suspected. Yep, that's where this is headed. 
Jesperson's first known victim was Tawana Bennett on the 21st of January 1990 near Portland, Oregon. He introduced himself to Bennett at a bar and invited her over to a house he was renting. After getting into an argument with Bennett, he strangled her to death with his bare hands and disposed of her body. And the guy probably has catcher mitts for hands, bear claws. If he stands six foot seven and a half, 240, big boy, big hands. On August 30th, 1992, the currently unidentified body of a woman Jesperson had raped and strangled was found near Blythe, California, in the United States. Jesperson gives the Jane Doe a name of Claudia. A month later, in Turlock, California, the body of Cynthia Lynn Rose was discovered. Jesperson claimed Rose was a sex worker who entered his truck at a truck stop while he slept. His fourth victim, another sex worker, Lori Ann Pentland of Salem, Oregon, whose body was found in November of 1992. According to Jesperson, Pentland attempted to double the fee she charged him for sex because he had been engaged with her. She threatened to call the police, and he strangled her to death. Jesperson killed his next victim in June of 93 in Centinella, California. She was an unidentified woman who he claimed was named Carla or Cindy. Police considered her death a drug overdose, but obviously that wasn't the case. In September of 94, another Jane Doe was found in Crestview, Florida. Jesperson claimed that her name was Suzanne. Jesperson was eventually arrested on March 30th, 1995 for the murder of Julie Winningham. He had been questioned by the police a week before, but they had no grounds to arrest him after he refused to talk. In the days following, Jesperson decided that he was certainly going to be arrested, and after two suicide attempts, turned himself in, hoping it would result in leniency during his sentencing. Now, while in custody, Jesperson began revealing details of killings and making claims of many others. But true to form, he recanted many of these later on. A few days before his arrest, he wrote a letter to his brother in which he confessed to having killed eight people over the course of five years. This led various police agencies in several states to reopen old cases many of which were found to be possible victims of Jesperson. Although Jesperson at one point claimed to have killed as many as 185 people, only the eight women killed in Washington, Oregon, California, Florida, Nebraska, and Wyoming have been confirmed. He is serving three consecutive life sentences at the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem. In September 2009, Jesperson was indicted in Riverside County, California on murder charges as well. He was extradited in December of 09. He was convicted of another murder and received a fourth life sentence in January 2010. Now here's where a little bit of a twist and a kick comes into this play and we're gonna get to the whole happy smiley face emoji spray paint graffiti thing as well. Don't you worry. Early on in the investigation of Bennett's murder that was Jesperson's first victim, Laverne Pavlinik read the news report surrounding her death and saw it as an opportunity to force an end to a long-term abusive relationship she had with her live-in boyfriend, John Sosnovsky. Pavlinik set up a meeting with investigators and gave a false confession using the details she had read in the newspaper to give a detailed story of how Sosnovsky forced her to help him rape, murder, and dispose of Bennett's body. Pavlinik and Sosnovsky were both arrested on March 5, 1990, and both were convicted of murder on the 8th of February 1991. To avoid the possibility of facing the death penalty, Sosnovsky pleaded no contest. He was sentenced to life in prison while Pavlenik was sentenced to no less than 10 years, much more than she had anticipated. And it wasn't soon after that that Pavlenik admitted to making up the entire story, but her claims were ignored. Naturally, you confess to killing people and then say, oh, wait, I got jail time. Maybe I didn't actually kill these people after all. Well, it doesn't work like that, sweetheart. So enjoy your jail time, I guess. On January 7th, 1996, more than five years after their confession, Pavlenik and Sosnovsky were released from prison after Jesperson and his attorney offered his confession with convincing evidence of his guilt. He had given police officers the location of the victim's purse. The purse had not been found at the crime scene, and its location was considered information only the killer would know. So what does all this have to do with the smiley face? Well, like any good broadcaster, I'm going to leave the best bit till the end. Well, maybe not even the best bit, just a cliffhanger. 
Now, following Bennett's murder, all the attention was going to Pavlenik and Sosnovsky. Jesperson did, well, what any good serial killer would do, and wrote a confession on the bathroom wall of a truck stop and signed it with a smiley face. When that didn't create enough attention, he wrote letters to the media and police departments confessing his murders, starting with a six-page letter to the Oregonian, in which he revealed the details of his killings. And Jesperson, of course, signed each letter with a smiley face. This led Phil Stanford, the journalist working on the story for the Oregonian, to dub Jesperson the happy face killer. There you go, that's where it all comes from. Everything comes full circle. Now his daughter, Melissa, did a whole thing trying to, I guess, clear the air with her dad or maybe even cash in on some media attention. She did the circuit. She did the Oprah show. She appeared on Dr. Phil. She had a Lifetime movie called Monster in My Family and a 2020 special on ABC, as well as a book, a uh, whole bunch of other things, whole bunch of other things. And I don't know why. To me, I think you'd want to let go of that. Just kind of forget about all that shit that ever happened with you and your dad or what your dad did. But some people crave and thrive on the media attention. But that's not up to me to decide if she wants to do that stuff and make a million dollars off her dad by all fucking means. A billion dollars. A trillion dollars. I mean, this guy owes her, I guess, everything. He was a serial killer and left her with nothing. So I guess you go, girl. That's going to do it for us today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. My name is Casey, and if you did like what you heard, you can absolutely leave a five-star rating on Spotify. Yes, that's still a new thing, and I highly suggest you do that. Now, you can't leave reviews on Spotify just yet, but if you do leave that rating, feel free to let me know, and I'll give you a shout-out on the show. Regardless, I've noticed a few new ones up there, so thank you very much for that. You can still leave a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts as well. And any five-star reviews will be read out on the show. So like I said, shout out to you if you do that. And you can follow along on social media. On Twitter at HorrorShotsProd, as in production. Or even on Instagram, which I've been updating a lot more recently. So if you want to see some cool stuff, head over to Instagram. And that is at Ominous Origins Pod, Or on Facebook at, well, HorrorShots. And that's all I got for you this week. So until next time.